Um, welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for the organizers for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm going to talk to you for about um, 10 minutes on um, the current um, CDC guidelines that were um, first disseminated in 2007 uh, regarding isolation precautions. Um, this is really setting the, the baseline for further discussion. As many of you will note, um, uh, updated evidence uh, warrants um, uh, changes to some of the aspects to uh, this set of guidelines. So these are some of the um, areas that I'll touch upon in my remarks. Um, I'm going to start with um, a set of um, practices that the CDC calls core infection prevention and control practices for safe healthcare delivery in all settings. Um, these are really important because these, a lot of these measures will stand the test of time and continue to be applicable going forward. Uh, these represent fundamental standards of care to, um, uh, to implement infection prevention and control in all settings where healthcare is delivered, not just hospitals, but uh, outpatient clinics, um, homes, pharmacies, and other places where healthcare is delivered. All healthcare personnel who have potential for direct or indirect um, exposure to patients um, should follow these practices. And before delving into specifics, it's really important to understand uh, the groundwork that has to be in place to make these measures effective. Um, healthcare facilities need strong leadership support. Uh, along with accountability and sufficient resources to implement these core measures. Uh, we need um, strategies for educating healthcare personnel, but also patients and families, uh, because they are important um, factors uh, for um, infection prevention and control. And finally, we need to emphasize uh, performance measures and feedback both to leadership and frontline staff on how they're doing. I'm going to move on to standard precautions. Um, this is another core measure that applies to all patient care in all settings, and this should be implemented regardless of uh, the level of suspicion for any um, um, potential or confirmed infectious states. The purpose of standard precautions is both to protect the healthcare personnel from infection and also transmission of infections to other patients. And this is a set of standard precautions that um, should be implemented across the board. Um, hand hygiene practices with an emphasis on alcohol-based hand rub, um, environmental cleaning and disinfection using um, EPA-approved disinfectant products, um, robust injection and medication safety that emphasizes aseptic technique and practices, and then use of um, appropriate PPE based on the activities that um, you are performing. So for example, if you do anticipate uh, direct contact with any bodily fluids or splashes, um, you should really be wearing gown gloves and, um, and a face shield. Um, next is minimizing potential exposures. And there are various strategies for this, including um, implementing point of entry screening to identify potentially uh, infectious individuals, and um, really emphasizing standard respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, including um, uh, covering uh, nose and mouth if there are respiratory symptoms and potentially using masking. And then lastly, there's reprocessing of uh, reusable medical equipment, uh, which depends on the intended use of the equipment and the intensity of reprocessing from uh, disinfection all the way to sterilization. There are situations where there is a, a substantial risk of transmission despite adherence to standard precautions, and this is where um, the concept of transmission-based precautions apply. And these are recommended for um, certain patients with suspected or confirmed diagnoses um, that pose a higher risk of transmission. These measures should be implemented as soon as there is a suspected diagnosis, and then they can be discontinued if that has been ruled out. Communication is important for patients who have transmission-based precautions implemented uh, during transitions of care to different teams or facilities, uh, these have to be communicated clearly. 
Um, to better understand the rationale for transmission-based precautions, I remind uh, people about the chain of infection. Um, and this is applicable for uh, and is, is different for uh, the given pathogen and describes how um, pathogens go from reservoirs to portals of exit and entry into a susceptible host. Um, if we can understand this chain and break the chain at any point, then transmission uh, will be interrupted. To simplify things, um, CDC really emphasizes three areas of, um, uh, of um, promoting transmission in healthcare settings. Uh, we need to understand the source or reservoir of infectious agents. These could be patients, healthcare staff, or uh, material. We need to understand who is susceptible um, to um, uh, uh, acquiring an infection. These are um, potentially modifiable by vaccination or PPE use. And then lastly, understanding for um, the pathogen of concern, what is the primary uh, potential modes of transmission. So breaking any of these areas will help us interrupt uh, transmission. So in the 2007 guidelines, the CDC um, broke down um, three primary modes of transmission. And I've shown some of the classic examples of these. Um, contact um, transmission is through direct or indirect contact uh, with um, patient bodily fluids or uh, materials, fomites that might be contaminated. In um, pathogens that transmit via droplets, um, that's usually by um, larger respiratory secretions um, that have to um, travel through the air and land directly on uh, mucous membranes um, or conjunctiva. That's sort of an extension of contact uh, transmission, uh, but over a short range. And then the third category is airborne, where um, uh, uh, smaller respiratory particles can remain suspended for prolonged duration and travel longer distance uh, for transmission. So they have a, um, uh, a schema of um, recommendations depending on the pathogen of concern uh, for how we should be placing patients either in single rooms um, uh, or um, if necessary uh, for contact and droplet precautions. Uh, there can be um, multi-patient rooms with um, a certain degree of separation. Uh, for pathogens primarily um, transmitted via the airborne route, route uh, an airborne infection isolation room is necessary, uh, which has specifications for negative pressurization and minimum ventilation uh, requirements. And then the key parts of the PPE associated with contact, droplet, and airborne are listed here, with gown and gloves being key to prevent contact transmission, at least a medical mask, um, and uh, to protect against um, droplet transmission. And finally, airborne uh, routes uh, require an N9 or higher level respirator. So we often, um, as frontline clinicians, um, may not know what a patient um, has uh, in terms of a confirmed diagnosis. So in implementing transmission-based precautions, we have to recognize uh, clinical syndromes that may be associated with uh, pathogens that require transmission-based precautions. And these are just a short list of some of the examples that the CDC uh, provides. Uh, for example, a patient who uh, presents with rash or exanthems that are generalized of unknown etiology with a vesicular nature, we have to think of um, things like varicella zoster virus uh, potentially um, as the cause and empirically uh, implements uh, airborne plus contact precautions. And there's various examples of these that um, we need to um, think about as frontline clinicians. So um, it's, it's important to know that um, the concept of uh, droplet versus airborne is um, really not dichotomous and subsequent speakers will get into this, um, but um, updated understanding um, uh, of the science um, 
shows that um, many respiratory viruses um, can be transmitted uh, longer distance through respiratory aerosols. But what are these aerosols and droplets? So it's really a spectrum of size of respiratory secretions where um, uh, larger size secretions uh, generally are, uh, fall within a meter of the source and don't remain suspended. But the smaller the size, um, the, the longer that particle remains suspended in the air and can potentially tra travel longer distances. So related to this, um, I do want to say a word about uh, aerosol generating procedures. Uh, this is a um, complicated concept, which is fraught with controversy. It's a bit of a misnomer because um, some of these uh, procedures, um, uh, there, there are other activities that can actually generate more aerosols than some of these uh, procedures. But the concept that was described in the 2000, 2007 guidelines are that there are certain medical procedures that are prone to generating small particle aerosols. And this is a list of some of the examples that the CDC has provided. This is definitely not a complete list and um, there is no definitive list. But the, um, the mechanism behind this is that transmission during these uh, situations is increased um, due to forced air over moist uh, respiratory mucosa. Um, patients who have a lot of symptoms or disease severity uh, being close uh, proximity to patients and prolonged duration. These are um, situations that um, uh, increase the risk of transmission and the minimum precautions for PPE should be at least eye protection, masking, and gown gloves. However, if um, you cannot exclude the possibility of uh, airborne transmissible transmissible pathogens, an N95 respirator really should be used. And that is what we recommend in our uh, facilities. Lastly, I do wanna say a word about occupational health because there is a big um, uh, interplay between infection control and occupational health. Um, these are some of the key recommendations from the CDC. Uh, first, to ensure that healthcare personnel uh, receive uh, recommended immunizations against vaccine preventable diseases. Um, we should all implement sick leave policies that can avoid uh, staff showing up to work if they're potentially ill. And then lastly, there are uh, various OSHA policies meant to protect healthcare workers uh, against infectious agents. Uh, and they're listed here, including bloodborne pathogen standards, uh, respiratory protection standards, and uh, the TB compliance directive. 